Well, well you tell those guys to shut up. I can. They're no, talking amongst yeah, yeah. themselves. No, but one time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, you can. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, you know that, right? It's very nice. Oh, Can you hear us? And he does, he, he doesn't have COVID. You know, we just, <laughs> we just, we just he doesn't have COVID. <laughs> hey, Dave, do you want to ask these guys if they can hear you? Can you guys hear me? On the Zoom. Okay, you're up. Can they? Oh, we did it. Can they hear us? No. <laughs> you, could you mute yourself? Please mute yourself. Okay, go. Yeah. <laughs> this is good. Okay, well, Jerry, uh, I don't want to mess with this too much. Uh, uh, Jerry, we've been waiting months for this. <laughs> So you better be good. <laughs> These guys think you're walking on water, so they're gonna fly out. I know where they are. <laughs> but Jerry has been a friend for 30, 40 years, a long, long time. And I'll tell you just a little bit about his business, and then I'll tell you a little bit about him. Um, but he owns Desert Star Construction. And uh, Desert Star builds individual resorts, and they are a resort. So his houses go from 20, 60,000 square feet. And his clients are who's who in America. He doesn't talk about them, but uh, if you knew the names of them, you'd know every single one of them. And they're all here in Arizona. Uh, Jerry and his company has been recognized in multiple publications, I think probably about 30 of them. Um, his annual revenue is to the roof, so he's very, extremely successful. But I think one thing you'll find out about Jerry when we go through this today is, yes, he's made a lot of money, but what has he done with it? One of the things he, he did uh, for the Dream Center, downtown Phoenix, uh, put their kitchen, which is 1,500 square feet, out of it to 4,000 square feet. And now they serve over, they have served over five and a half million meals. People on the street, prostitutes, the people that are in need. Uh, recently, he also then renovated some rooms down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, over 712 people in the trafficking, these young girls, 14, 20 years old, have stayed in those rooms. They found those rooms as a sanctuary. So he's, he's done a lot. Today, his son fired him. <laughs> now, his son now is doing a lot of the business, running the business. Jerry's still there mentoring him, but his son is doing a lot of the work. And Jerry is spending his time Mentoring businessmen, where's Neil? Mentoring oh. pastors. <laughs> <laughs> His specialty is pastors that play hockey. I'm a <laughs> <laughs> and he travels. He travels to the United States. He speaks. He's written a number of books. We have one over there that some of you. I covered a bunch, so you guys wouldn't take them in the beginning, but some of you have taken them. And so everybody gets a book today from, from Jerry, and he has uh, he has autographed it for one of them for you. Um, Jerry is married to Carol for almost 40 years. He has two sons, Jeremy and Jonathan. And so I am more than proud to call him a friend, but let me just, I want to read a, a Bible verse that I think kind of summarizes uh, who Jerry is. Deuteronomy 8.18. And you shall remember the Lord, your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get the wealth. And Jerry recognizes that everything he has, everything he has, has come from the Lord. And he lives God's will. And God's will originally was his business, and now it's changed a little bit where he's mentoring, speaking, taking his chances for him. He's on day star. That's really a great presentation. Um, and I think he understands, and he's taught me a lot. Um, but 
God's will always lies on the other side of faith. So we can we can have head knowledge of God's will. So we've got to step up and we have to take that action in order for us to really realize God's will. And guys, he has done that. This is what he does daily. So let me pray. <clears throat> and then um, we're going to ask Jerry to come and share. <clears throat> Father, we just uh, thank you for Jerry. We thank you for this group. And Lord, our hearts are heavy this morning for what's going on in Ukraine. Yeah. You know, this morning I was told it was like 20 degrees. It's cold. A lot of these people don't have water, food, heat. And the children, the women. Lord, I know you're sovereign. We've been studying your sovereignty. And we know you have a plan. But Lord, I would just ask if somehow you could bring this to a resolution and you could help these people and save these people as you have the power and Lord we're putting our faith in that power and I ask that you would bless each and every man here and their families and we're just so thankful that uh, we have this opportunity in this country to do what we're doing right now because we're just studying your word and we ask these things in your name. Mr. Meek. <laughs> Very much. It is my honor to be here. Um, I really do exist. I, <laughs> I think the only time I will probably do something is when we brought our first son home from the hospital. After missing cancer here twice for COVID, it's like, God, don't let me get on a wreck. Just like, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, uh, it's an honor for me to be here. I think in life, we all need somebody who believes in us more than we believe in ourselves. That's who David Gavin is in my life. And he says he's gotten stuff from me. Well, I'm the beneficiary of that relationship, but I think all of you are as well. So we're going to kind of go at a pace, and I had something all planned out uh, to talk about today, but I don't think I'm going to do that. So I was up at four this morning and kind of rearranged my notes because my presence here is not about what I want to say. It's more about how can I help you and where are you in your journey. And me talking is not a problem. I could go on for hours, and I won't. But I do want to stop. And my favorite part is the Q&A, because I want to find out what your needs are, what you're going through, and how I can help you. <laughs> We're going to get right at it. Um, and thank you to the IT department there. You're awesome. So I want somebody here to remember to ask me about this later. That's just what it's going to be. So since 1988, we've been hired for a very large personal resort that we built. It was the first time that it was an eight-figure project, and it was significant. I was terrified for the first six months. So when it came time to pick the exterior uh, finish sample, it was an EPA system, and some of you know that's a synthetic material. I said, hey, I've got an idea. Would you like us to paint all of these samples on four by nine sheets of textured material. That way we can see how the light reflects on it, put it in different spaces, different times of day, rather than a, a wall or something that doesn't move. They said, that's a great idea. Well, what I didn't realize was we ended up making hundreds of samples of co different colors, hundreds. Yeah, I mean, there was a hundred sheets of this masonry material strewn across this whole five acre parcel on the hillside in Paradise Valley. And, you know, let no good deed go unpunished. So after a grueling two months of color selections by the design team, the owner, architect, the interior designer, by the way, I don't know why the interior designer gets to help outside and she was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> we come to our color, it is ash gray. Now under normal circumstances, we always, and I mean always, send the paint color to the synthetic manufacturer and they send us a sample back that everybody signs, except for this one time. I'm behind schedule. I'm not 
the patient person I am today, back in my day. I had issues back then. I have lots of issues back then. So I've become so frustrated with the process and everything. I figured, you know what? I'm going to bypass the, my process. I can make the rules, but I can break them too. So <clears throat> I get the right paint number. <clears throat> I got the wrong paint manufacturer. <laughs> right number, wrong paint. <laughs> so as you can probably imagine what's coming next, I'm coming back from vacation, and back in those days, I would vacation when the clients are gone, then I, they would be bothering me and I wouldn't miss a call. <laughs> so as I come and I'm driving over the hill in the Paradise Valley, I turn the corner, and instead of it, the house looking like this, it looked like this. <laughs> So the name of this paint is called Party Hat. <laughs> the remainder of the project, I was the Party Hat builder. <laughs> so being Jerry, I'm pretty transparent. I'm an open, honest, and direct guy. I called the client. They're up in Colorado, I believe, at the time. And when I say ma'am or sir, it's because I can't really tell you who lives there. So I just want you to know I'm not losing my memory. I said, if you get any calls from any of your neighbors or your friends or family, and they mention the Pink Panther to you, I just want you to know I made a colossal mistake on your home, and I apologize in advance. In any event, I went to the clients. It was a $60,000 error, and back then, that was significant. They offered to pay for it, and I said no. I said, why? It was my mistake, my lack of patience, my lack of following my own process, as I said, it's on me, I can't do it. So it didn't all go to waste. There was a guy by the name of Joe who we still work with and have worked with for over 40 years. He goes down to builds churches in Mexico. I said, Joe, can you use this material on these buildings that you're building? He goes, sure. So all I can say is, if you ever in Mexico and you see a <laughs> church, don't you know, think of me. <laughs> I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. That one was the most colorful one. <laughs> okay. But I've always kept going, even when times are tough. I was beat up and bullied going to the school, grade school, and I mean beat up. I had a fear of water, I'd get thrown into canals. Couldn't swim, hated it. I was a terrifying year. Um, and what was very difficult is I never really, I didn't go to college, I didn't get the education, I got bad advice. And I feel like I had a chip on my shoulder for the first 40 years of my life. And I was just, you know, good enough. Some of the challenges where people told me I couldn't do something. The travesty was I believed them. And I believed them more than I believed myself. We've had many health scares. We buried a daughter. We have challenges just like you do in your business, in your family, in your life. But I don't give up. It's the first 10 years of our business, my average income was $9,070 a year. That means some were a little better, some were a little worse. <laughs> the first 20 years, our, rep, our income was $17,000 a year. I don't care what inflation calculator you put that in, that ain't much. <laughs> but I will say, nothing was ever handed to me. And I paid the price and I earned it. But I knew something needed to change in my life. And there was a significant time when it came is I stopped asking God to bless what I was doing. And I asked God, what do you want me to do? And the answer has been yes, continuously. And that was a that was a watershed event in my life. And today I want to share with you something. Um, and I do have enough technology here. So I'm going to switch to my iPad now because I changed all this this morning. As soon as I recognize this, it will be good. Thank you. So I've told you about some of my humble beginnings. At 14 years old, I bought a pickup truck. But if you remember a Corvair truck, that's what I got. 
Eight hundred dollars <laughs> towards cost of the tree trimming. So I hired a recovering alcoholic to drive that for me. And I was making bank. I was also doing that during the era of oil embargo, which I know some of you remember. So instead of paying this guy the ten dollars an hour to drive, I've got five gallon cans. I'm walking to the gas station and standing in line and going back and forth to the house that I lived in to fill the truck up. It just wasn't a was. But in 2008, when the prices came in the economy, we lost $27 million worth of work in 45 days. That was 100% of our revenue. I was stuck. I didn't know what to do. But what's interesting is, and Dave mentioned our clients, every one of you have used their product, you're using their products right now. And it's pretty intimidating for a guy who grew up and lived in the trailer. But I had to pretty much figure out hey, how am I going to do this? I can't do it on my own. I'd always felt my first contract negotiation at 19 years old as the then president of Double Treat Hotels. I felt like I was in a canoe and was in this aircraft carrier. That was kind of my perspective, and it was really true. But I learned more from Jim and still use what he taught me today. And yeah, we're still friends. So, we're all facing challenges in our business right now in our lives. And the Great Resignation is the biggest challenge in business by survey today because two thirds of people are not performing up to what they should be doing in the business. They're unconsciously checked out. The other third survey says, says they are consciously checked out. So when you take a look at that, thinking about the lack of skills, lack of volume, um, we're in the construction industry, and we not only build new, but we have a concierge division that takes care of homes, not just that we built, but other people's homes. And it's a tough market out there. The expectations are higher than they've ever been. People's patience is tired. I think the great resignation is people have resigned their lives. They've given up. They've quit. And as believers, we have, we have a different source. And that's what I want to share with you today. And I'm going to sit if that's okay with everybody. I'm Italian. I got to move my hands and everything. <laughs> so, you know, it's not cash flow. It's too, it used to do, we had too many employees and not enough work. Now we have too much work and not enough employees. So it's, it's just a changing tide. I think everybody needs to lean into that, but to trust God. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Proverbs 3 today. It is something that hit me a year and a half ago. This is what I want to bring to you this morning. And this is something when I set the pivot in my life, that transformation, instead of God bless what I'm doing, it's now what do you want me to do? Or the answer is yes. And I think what happened in my revelation of this, and I want to share it with you, is it says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. So what's interesting to me is, that's chapter 3. Well, chapters 1 and chapter 2 are all about giving wisdom. And I think what sometimes happens for me, and it might happen to you, is we think because we gained all this experience and all this wisdom, <coughs> we start thinking we can do it on our own. So we forget to seek the Lord trust in the Lord because, oh, I've got this, God. And I will tell you, and it's for experiences in my life, if I can do it on my own, it's not a God thing. If I am not leaning in and trusting God more and more every day in my, for my personal matters, for my business matters, it really becomes a pride thing. God, I got this. A island is a problem. And I think what happens is when we go to the Lord first and trust in Him fully, that is when we can really rest in the Lord. And frankly, I feel more at peace now than I ever have in my life before. And I've got more stuff going on just like you. That's seven deaths in six months last year. Three of them were parents. Both my mom and my dad and my wife's mom. I had a grief hangover. And what bothered me the most of the seven, one of them wasn't a believer. And that was devastating to me. Somebody that worked in our company for 16 years, and no matter the influence, it just, I don't know, it's just one of those things, and I think we all, we all face those things, but the word trust means to put your entire weight on something, not just a little bit, 
but your entire way. It was all your heart means without exception. God says, trust me completely, and I can, and I will sustain you. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Think of it as that umbrella uh, insurance policy that you have. That is an overall statement that he's covering everything and anything that's going on in our lives. And I think that's the point where I continue to develop. And it's about pleasing God in all things. That's to be our goal. Not just some things, not every once in a while, but all the, all the time. Direct by paths is the shortest distance between the two points. My great geometry, thank you very much. This is a straight line. It's the only thing I learned in that class. I barely passed. <laughs> but I think what it is, when we're talking about pursuing the will of God, there's going to be a lot of curves in the road. And I love what Dave shared with me years ago. Your faith is like driving at night. You can only see what your headlights are on. It's got to be curves. But I think with God, when we see them, it's going to be a straight line, even if we don't see it at the time. And I think that's so important. So no matter what's, what we face, God's word has something to say about it. Because most, most of you read your Bible on a regular basis in this room. You have a program of that? Okay, I'm going to admit that. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I, I'm betting more on the people in the room and not the IT guy. He's got you figured out already. Yeah. Well, same commentary that we decided seventy percent of all pastors would quit if they had no job to do. That's the crisis in ministry today. Seventy percent, and most of it's because they become isolated. They don't feel like they can relate to somebody, and I think we all as men, we isolate naturally, but that they don't have somebody they can come to, and hey, I've got this issue, and that cone of silence, because trust's been broken, and I don't know why I said that, but thank you for doing right. what you're doing. It's, uh, I work with a lot of pastors, and I'll tell you, I love it, I care for them, they've got the hardest job, I really do, it makes my life and job easy, what they do, we should continue to pray for our pastors. So, why do I talk about this? I believe if we live the life that God intended, and I read a Proverbs every day, and I read Proverbs 3 every day. Because in Proverbs 3, you know, how does this apply to me? How can I put more trust in God? Are we, and this is where I want to encourage you to stay in bed. Because when I talk about fully trusting on your way, I was thinking the best I've had over in my life. I had a water bed, I got the air mattress, now I got a sleep number bed that corrects the, the pressure, I can put the foot warmer on, it's pretty cool, but even telling me my breath rate, there's just way too much information, so if my watch isn't telling me to breathe or to work out, my bed's telling me when I'm not breathing, you know what I need to work out, so I'm way too connected technologically, and I think some of us are also, but think about the trust in the Lord, and think about this when you go to bed tonight. Are you fully in your bed? Or are you laying there with your head hanging out or your arm hanging out? Think about, are you really trusting God fully? Because that's what he wants. And I think it's really important that we remain, remember that in a practical way. Because when I look across this room, I see a lot of great futures here. But I see a lot of wisdom as well. And I see a lot that's been accomplished, but I see more that can be done. I... Uh, I pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give me wisdom to say things at the time that will encourage and challenge people. And when I'm in a room with this much experience, and I look at Dave, I know how old he is, and you probably do too. I don't think I could keep up with him if I had to like shadow him every day. And there's nothing in the Bible and there's nothing in Jewish law that has a work for retirement. Amen. I had, a, I had a, a series, I had six Jewish clients all at the same time. I've never had any. So I took Ancestry DNA, I'm 9% Jewish, if it counts, because that's what it told me. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, I go to uh, read Daniel Penn's book, Business Secrets of the Bible, and he talked about that as a Messianic Jew. And he talks about 
why would you stop working at a certain point in time? Why would you stop? Who's going to care for your clients when you step aside? Maybe you're not as busy. Maybe you don't have the energy, but you still have the value. And I think we need to keep everybody in here needs to find somebody that they're pouring into consistently. There's such a lack of mentorship because everybody's believing that Kool-Aid commercial, I call it, the trick of the Kool-Aid for retirement. You got the gray-haired guy and the 30-year-old wife who lives at the gym and they're running down the beach and they're trying to get money in their 401ks. So I think what we need to do, remember, as believers, we've got a greater calling. And one of the questions I ask myself when it comes to giving, and I ask myself in terms of where I invest my time, is it going to show up in heaven? Because that's all that really matters. My wife and I used to invest in our company scholarships at public universities, secular universities, and science center, and you name it. Our clients were involved, we supported what they were doing. But if it doesn't show up in heaven, we don't do it anymore. And that was what my friend Lee taught me. That's not ROI, it's E-R-O-I. It's eternal return on investment. So I just want to encourage you, if you're not mentoring somebody now, family member or non-family <clears throat> member, find somebody. Because you're valued. You've got a lot to offer. So how does this apply to me? So in terms of application, how can I put more trust in God? You need to find out and ask yourself, am I laying in that bed fully? And when I, my litmus test for am I trusting in God, who do I ask first? When I've got a situation, am I picking up the phone? Am I really asking the creator of the universe? I think it's easier for me to call Dave and say, I've got an issue. Hey, Dave, can you help me out with this? And Dave's a good friend. He'll say, Jerry, did you ask the Lord yet? And sometimes it'd be yes, and sometimes it'd be no. And I think what we need to do is, so that's my litmus test, and it might work for you too. Are you asking your wife? Are you asking a friend? Are you asking somebody that's got no idea what the answer is, but you want them to agree with you? That's the big one. So I want to encourage you to stay in bed, um, fully in bed when you go to bed, okay? Um, but you know, in terms of how can we apply this today, think about how your life could be if you did fully trust in the Lord, if you would fully ask him for everything first and depend on him totally. And to me, I'm a work in progress. I'd like to tell you that I've got it all figured out, but my insecurities come back up at times and the fear comes in, but I keep leaning in. It's just some of these things I think God puts in our lives that to keep us growing, to keep challenging us. And I think we need to do that. So I want you to imagine your life being on a straight road. And in Proverbs 3, 4, it says that you receive favor and a good man when you trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I would like to encourage you to walk in that favor. And I want to share with you a story. Um, I, I talked about 2008 when everything changed. Um, we had no work. I was like, what do I do? And everybody thought, oh, because you'll always have work. You've got the wealthiest people in the world. And they're your clients. Well, no, we didn't. And I made a conscious decision. I gathered everybody in our conference <laughs> And I said, if I were to start your business today, it would not be construction. You could have heard a pin drop. I didn't realize I was going to get that. Oh my gosh, we're getting fired because people are going on to left and right. <laughs> I said, we're not going to participate in this economy. So we got the best clients. I believe we got the best team in the industry. We got the best trades. I said, no one's getting laid off. My wife and I didn't think salary until it turned around. I was thinking six months. I wasn't <laughs> thinking two and a half years. <laughs> okay. And as a good friend of mine who's a turnaround expert said, Jerry, what you did was admirable, but it's not responsible. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> because when it turned around, everybody thought they were going to get raises. But we never cut their pay like everybody else was doing. <laughs> so that was the uh, not responsible part and paid a price for that. So let's fast forward to 2015. I've got 13 projects closing out in the fourth quarter. We're just killing it. Everything's going well. Great clients, great projects. <coughs> I could not 
get an interview. I couldn't get an appointment. We subdivided a property for one client. We actually sold this other well-known football player here in Arizona. Couldn't even get a return call. I'd go for interviews and we've got a 90 plus percent conversion rate when we meet with people. I'm like, God, what is going on? And our team was like, and then, by the way, I don't have a fully Christian organization. We have more believers in our team now than we did back then. <clears throat> to grow in that area. But I said, guys, I don't know. We made it to 2008 trying to get through this. And every night it was on my knees. God, it's not for my sake, but for yours. I'm trusting you. I need you to be strong for me. Nothing like crickets. Just like 2008, but I didn't, I'd lost a little bit of my hope, but it was more, okay, God, be strong for me again. Trust in you. And what was interesting to me, and I've written about this in the next book that's coming out, but within a 48 hour period in December of 2015, we signed two contracts. For the lot, two of the largest homes, not just built in Arizona, built in America. And to get one would have been awesome. To get two in parallel, one hand I was pure ecstasy, the other was sheer terror. I had <laughs> no idea how we were going to do it. Now, one of our project managers asked me, Well, Jerry, what's your plan? I said, You know what? I didn't bring the work in, so I'm going to have to trust God to give us the plan to do it because I don't know. And that took a long process. We took out the owners and their wives of all the companies we worked with. It's like, hey, before we commit to these projects, are you in with us? You stand by us. And 100% of everybody said, Jerry, you guys pay us on time. You treat us fair. We're there. We'll turn down other work. So we had a lot of companies working 100% for us for three years. Each one of these projects, you could order magnitude at over 3 million labor hours in it. That boggles my mind. And when COVID came, my son, Jeremy, who didn't actually fire me, but uh, we've been on a 10 year transition. <laughs> um, and I couldn't take another year. So on year nine, he became president uh, this year on January 1. He says, Dad, you, you are not allowed to go on the jobs. I said, Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Dad, he goes, you could be the main spreader of COVID because you hug everybody. <laughs> so I adjusted what I was doing. But what was interesting to me, we signed both these contracts. It's January. I'm taking a client through a home that just sold for record price in Paradise Valley that we built a few years ago. It's $2,006 a square foot it sold for. Which is that's a lot in any market, even in California. <laughs> okay, I'm on my hands and knees showing them all the details. Like, we don't use caulking compound, I don't think that's a construction material. We scribe this imported wood floor into this handcrafted baseboard. And I'm getting all excited, and I turn around and look up. It's like, why am I selling you? I have the contract, and the client says, Oh, I'm having fun, just keep going. But when you talk about trusting God with all your heart. And trusting God for more than you're capable of. I had a moment right then. I had to hold myself together. We have two of the largest houses ever built in the state, just awarded to us. Neither one of them had ever been in one of the homes we built. Neither one of them knew any of our clients that I'm aware of. And I never worked with either of them. When you look at all that, that's a scary dynamic from the responsible side. It was really God's position. I left that house. I turned over in front of Al I pulled over and I just started crying. I was so thankful what God brought us through. But I knew it was God's favor because it had nothing to do with me. And I want to encourage all of you, no matter what challenge you're going through right now in your business, your daddy, your kids, trust God fully. But trust him. Just, just don't have a belief. Have a conviction. But God, you're going to get me through this. And King David, I learned this at a young age. I sought all these things to like in my own will and in my own power and had all these trophies and different awards. And I justified it because King David, he had his trophies from this war. And I use those as altars in my life. God, what did you do? Thank you for doing that for me. 
but it was all a matter of stepping stones. Those first 20 years were painful, but everything I learned, every relationship that I formed in those 20 years, he got me to where I am today. So I just would tell people I was too stupid to know that I was being, I just kept on going. So in any event, I want to encourage you, those of you that don't read every day, Read a proverb every day. Mm -hmm. I like the message Bible because I'm a simple guy. That's the you know, King James. That's just not my thing. But and if you want the authentic, go to the NIV. They say that's one of the best translations. But I got a little pocket book that I have with the message proverbs. I've given that out more than anything else to people that aren't believers. And I just want to encourage you to, to, to do that. So, yeah, Dave, with your permission, I would like to open this up to Q&A for anybody who has any questions or wants clarification. And if I can't answer it, I will tell you. But please don't ask me where the houses are. <laughs> yes, sir. What kind of a banking relationship took you through all that? What kind of banking relationship yeah. took me through all that? That's a great question. So, I don't believe in debt. It wasn't a banking relationship. What I, uh, two points to that. Um, I've learned from every client. My, one of my earlier model jobs as an executive here of Congress says, How much money do you guys get up front? That's a great idea. <laughs> I never thought of asking that. I said, How, I said Norm, that was 25%. It was no problem. So now we get sizable, get sizable deposits, and it's a justification, a benefits of line in terms of discounts, in terms of their cash flow. Yeah. Yeah. So banking relationships, we've got great banking relationships now because we don't. <laughs> yeah. So it was personal hurt, but you know, and I believe in borrowing. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I want to pay my house off. But the guy who manages our finance is been crazy. I can refinance you for two and a half percent. I'm like, okay, I get that. So, but anyway, no, banking relationships are important, but I think it's the human relationships as a trade contractors that, that we really, that really helped us through it. Good. Yes, sir. Yeah. You probably get to it, but the story of the buffalo. Ah, thank you so much. Yeah. So, yeah. that would be my mascot for life. <laughs> if I had a, if I had an animal, I never wants to be an eagle or a lion. But I love the buffalo. In Ephesians, it says, "Having done all, stand." When you're going through adversity, <laughs> standing represents ground you've already taken. Sometimes wars are offensive. Sometimes they're defensive. So I'm up in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, five six years ago. I've been with my national peer group which was a blessing in my life in so many areas. So we're driving afterwards. Carol and I always stay an extra day to see the countryside. So we're driving and the storm's coming in and I saw these buffaloes. So I'm that guy who's like trying to get them to move. I'm jumping up and down. I'm making noise. I'm coming on the car. <laughs> Nothing, but an interesting observation. As the storm came in, the cows, ran away from the storm <clears throat> in the storm and then the storm passes them up the buffaloes they stood they stood and when the storm came they hit it head on they were in the storm the shortest amount of time by any measure and i think so many times my dad taught me that integrity is the only thing that i'll own but integrity truly is facing the demands of reality. And I think sometimes, sometimes I do this, so maybe you guys don't, but sometimes I might not turn into that storm. But I found that it's much easier to turn into the storm when something, it's like you want to deal with it when it's an acorn or an oak tree. And I think if we turn into those stones sooner, hit it head on, I think we're in the storm a shorter period of time. And for me, that's worked for me. So that's why I asked the buffalo. Thank you. Only about half the times I speak, people remember that question. So you are now the smartest guy in the room. I'm a banker. Oh, I love a banker. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> yes, sir. Twofold. Um, tell them they're Jewish. 
Oh, you can just did. <laughs> <laughs> well, 9% of you really love to hear When you found that you were 9% Jewish, did that have any effect on your relationship, your depth of relationship with God? And secondly, if you can't share, how did you come to Christ and when did you come to Christ? Uh, good questions. So the whole answer is for DNA because I didn't believe it. I took it again. I was the same result. <laughs> so I wanted to validate it. But honest to goodness, and I, I grew up hearing that the Jewish people were God's chosen people. It made a difference to me. I'm like, wow, maybe only 9% of me is chosen, but it's better than no percent. <laughs> no, but it was, it was really impactful. And but I also believe that God's no respect for a person. Um, thank you for asking about coming to faith. That's the most meaningful thing. So I had just, uh, we had lived in Northern California, stopped in Scottsdale for six months, first six months of my life, uh, sixth grade, going to seventh grade in Rochester, New York during desegregation. Um, and my friends, one was black and one was oriental because I was always the new kid, so I'd go to the guys that nobody else wanted to be friends with, and they were my friends. They accepted me for who I was. Go to eighth grade, same thing's going on. I'm carrying a knife to school, scheduling walkouts um, as a rebellion. I'm, here I am in seventh grade. I'm leading the charge down the street. We, the whole school cuts the locks. They locked us in the school, and we march down to City Hall. I'm like, oh, this is really cool, until it wasn't. My mom's one at 15, and they all lived in upstate New York where we were. <clears throat> the phone was ringing off. Hey, I saw Jay on TV. Did you know he was there? I was so busted. <laughs> Brief aside on that. Um, I was probably at the end of my rope. It's great. And my parents were believers at the time. My mom always had a belief in God. I was baptized Catholic. Um, we moved back to Tempe, Arizona, and I have been through so many struggles. I, the benefit of moving around a lot, I had I was able to get a fresh start every day. Or I should be every new year. And it's like, you know, it's high school, maybe it matters. So I'm gonna study harder, I'm gonna be better. And I landed at Tempe High School and went to Mesa High School my sophomore year, then to Paradise Valley, my junior year, where I met my <laughs> wife of 42 years this gym. So um, but there was a youth pastor there, Fuller grad, and <coughs> I wasn't going to accept, right? I wanted to know that it was real. I wasn't just going to do it because everybody else was doing it. And I don't know, and this may be over an oversimplification to you, especially to the IT guy. Um, he preached, we had a guest preacher in. It was kind of like, do you want to live in eternity or do you want to burn in hell? And I'm like, I know that's a really simple question, but like it made all the sense in the world to me. It was like, okay, I don't want to burn an L. It's like, but this is a great way to live. And he mentored me, Ken. He made, he made me read the attitudes. I worked on his car with him and just became really good friends. But he really challenged me to be salt and light, to let your light shine. And I've always loved, I still love the word. And I studied what that meant, let your light shine. And that light was on a stick. And you had to get it up as high as you could in a room that light would fall. And I figured, you know what? That should be us in our businesses. If we're going to do something, we should be the best at it. And I accepted Christ, and it gave me a confidence that I never had before that I had a father that loved me, that I had, I had people that believed in. And it changed my life, changed my world, and I haven't looked back. I feel like, and, you know, Billy Graham came back, came into town in 1972. And they, did any of you remember when Billy Graham came to town right up here? So they passed out these cards, like, will you volunteer? I'm like, sure. I'm 14. I, I can't drive it on the car. It's like, okay. And it's like, would you like a position of responsibility? I checked the box. <laughs> I didn't know what I was signing up for. They didn't know I was a kid, new believer. I was in charge of the ushers. So you got this 14 year old kid. I want you over here. I want you over there. And, you know, so I, I keep checking the box. 
you know what? You know what God's going to put you into. It was at that same time that Tom Landry had a breakfast, and I got invited. And said, Dallas Cowboys. I didn't, I'm not a sports guy. I had an athletic bypass early. That is, it's <laughs> not my deal. But wow, he's done really well. He's a believer. He's the first person as a believer I ever heard speak to a group. Like man, I want to be that guy someday. Just in life, not in football. So thank you for that question. Anybody else? I have a question. Oh, okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. During many of your successful times, how did you check your pride issues? And how did you get through them? I'll let you know how to figure it out. No. <laughs> um, I guess the first 20 years, I just didn't feel worthy. I didn't feel good enough. So there wasn't any pride issues. And I think what really, you know, humble thyself. Um, and I think what it is, so much of the Bible, we think it's all about getting to heaven. There's more said about how to live a life. And that's why I stick to the Proverbs. It's not about me. I've been very blessed to have relationships in my life where I know that leadership the your chart. The leaders at the bottom, it should be serving everybody above him. So as long as I kept my view on serving other people, and I really had it wasn't the jobs were so overwhelming. My first trip in a private jet and the client is a billionaire. It's like she's like flight attendant giving us McDonald's and giving us our whatever their breakfast sandwich was. It's like, what am I doing here? And I think what is everything that we've done has been so much more that I knew it wasn't me. It was pretty easy. You know, some of the and the stuff that I could do my own set up say no meaning. <laughs> and so I think I think that's part of it. And my wife Carol keeps me having any of someone's Maybe I should have started with that. <laughs> so, thank you. Okay. Uh, Jerry, with your uh, I think, you know, how do I keep people from, like, I'm working with these people, they're all billionaires. I think it's perspective, Dave. Um, I believe a witness should be asked. And especially in this period of time we're in, putting a fish on your card or telling people you're Christian, that's probably the worst thing you can do about your business right now. Because frankly, we're in that post-Christian era, era. And I think what we need to do is, it goes back to that seeking to excel that you gotta find at the church. I've only worked for one client that I knew before I signed a contract with. I didn't solicit business with my friends or people at my church or anything else. Of course, that I went on my own. And there was one client that called me Mr. Church. Because <laughs> um, they knew my faith. But what's interesting is if you're doing your best job, it's like, why does excellence matter? And I think with one, at one time I said, hey, my faith, when I do for you on your job, that's a reflection of how I feel about my Lord. And, and if they ask, it's like, am I reflecting his goodness, his honor, his integrity? And I think what it is too, the other thing is, I have never asked a client for anything. And I will tell you in the economy, and it was actually one couple that I did know beforehand. You may know Tom and Teresa Van Loyal when they were in our junior day, but she told me one time, she said, Jerry, in this world, the light's getting lighter and the dark's getting darker. Hmm. And you need to make sure that you just stay doing what you do best. And I think what it is, and that excellence in our delivery, people are going to ask, What's, what do you do? What do you do? How do you do it? Why do you do it? And then we started doing the Dream Center video. There's a lot of publicity on that. Some people like come subscribe to our peak communiques because they didn't believe it. And they told me so. So that's okay. So it's like there's a, there's a struggle out there. 
but I did ask a um, member of the Walter family for something one time, though, when we built their home as a rob. He said, I, This is the day by the <laughs> We're presenting this budget, which I was up all night putting together because the printer wouldn't print fast enough. Anyway, technology's changed. So Rob, I said, I gotta tell you, I said, I have a foreign policy never to ask a client for something. But I said, if things don't work out for me and building your house, I said, you can give me a job as a grader at your bell road store. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, stay real with your plans. You're not only somebody else. We dishonor God when we try and be like somebody else. And Rob told me, goes, Jerry, because we've got better stores than Bell Road. I'll think there is. <laughs> so, there you go. Um, just as we close, I do want to, again, ask one thing of you. And if you want to, it's up to you. Um, if I screen, I can kind of go. If you want a text challenge to 5544, it's a 21 day challenge how we can reflect on better in our lives. I would encourage you to do that. And if you don't want to do that, that's up to you too. I get nothing out of this. It's a gift. I want you all, I want all of us to grow and mature more. And it was actually Dave who bought those books, uh, Leadership on the Level. So, I would have given away. He wanted to pay, so yeah, I took his check. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how much he loves you. But read that book. Yeah, there's valuable principles in there. And by the way, it's a short book. It gets to the point. I'm kind of a no-nonsense guy. It talks about choosing your team, praying before you do it, get people to climb the mountain with you, people that you can teach, acknowledging your team. It's a great, great tool for the great resignation. If you really want to help, but if you can't use it, give it to somebody who can. But any other questions? Yes, sir. Real quick, you made a statement, and I'm new, I believe, I believe it. You made a statement yet about not posting that you're a Christian. What do you mean by that? I don't get that. Well, the Bible says that what you can do witnesses. I think of a courtroom. The witnesses can answer questions. I used it as a motivation that I could be the best that I could be. And then somebody would be like, what's the difference? Why are you happy in this storm? Why are you at joy when everything's falling around you? If we have, I personally feel like if we have to tell somebody that we're a believer, and they get that look on their face, like, oh, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Maybe it's us. So we're reflecting God's love, but we honor God for everything we do. I think it's less about telling people that you're a believer. When you believe in that you're a child of the king, when you believe in what God's got prepared for your life, there's only one of you. And God's got a plan for your life to pursue living that out. And that will change your perspective. And people are going to ask, what's the difference? Because every year, I don't set goals. I don't believe in setting goals. I make decisions. And every year, one standing one is I want to be totally unrecognizable in five years. And I think the only way to do that is become bigger on the inside than the outside. So keep investing in yourself, keep reading the word, and be in a group like this. It's the best thing. And congratulations. I'm looking forward to spending eternity with you. No, I mean that. All right. So, all right, gentlemen. Well, thank you. Ah, Corey's reflection. So now that I have, uh, now that I was fired by my son, <laughs> uh, Corey's reflections is my next entry, and I'm using it as a platform. I work with churches, business groups, business people. Um, one of my favorite things is I'm connected to a couple of Christian colleges, and I think what really it is, it's a pathway to learn how we as believers can reflect God's goodness. We get so much in business. I mean, I don't know about you, but you get so caught up, caught up in the what that we forget. We forget about the who. Who does God want us to become in this journey? But we end up chasing that mirage of the bigger house, the bigger car, stuff. And I think as we can reflect God's goodness in our life and focus on the things that really matter, that's what this is about. My hope is, is to, to encourage 
tired, worn out with these guys. But hey, there's more to it. It's not the money. Who are you becoming in this process? Yeah, I believe in that. I think we need to be bigger on the inside than on the outside, like I said before. Because what happens is we cannot sustain the success God wants us to have if our character is not built. If we can, I understand foundations, okay? We need a firm foundation on the Lord Jesus Christ and the principles that he offers. And that's what that's about. It's my chance to give back what I've learned and lived. But I don't just give it. I invest in people. And is when you invest in something, don't you keep an eye on it? I'm not a one and done guy. When I go speak somewhere, I'm not in a great room. I hate it. I want to shake hands like I did with so many of you this morning. I want to get to know you for people. And if I've got some free resources, another book that I wrote, so it's free. If you want to go to my website, it's jerryrmeek.com. And you can download all the stuff there for you. Do my honor. I'll help you. And yes, if you contact me, I will be you know, just so you know. It's on the website. But this is my season to help others get through some of the challenges and be what God's called them to be. You know, we all, we all, guys, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have people in my life to help me. My parents, friends, clients. I've got CEOs of publicly held companies that I can pick up on the phone. I'm toe to toe with these guys for several years sometimes, get to know them. But the difference is, my life, it wasn't what I learned, it's what I applied. If a client gave me some good tip, I took it, and I applied it to my life. It's not what you know, it's what you do with what you know. So, anyway, you guys are a great audience. I love coming in when people are like happy when they show up and they're talking to their half hour early. And, you know, oh, thank you so much. It really is an honor. Man. Let's look back.